Zie ikatali ima ande aluri ba andazi kafahaya. We give you honor, we give you glory, we give you praise. Blessed be the Lord, God who came from heaven to the earth. As Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, who gave his life on the cross, that by your shed blood we may be redeemed. By the resurrection of Christ we may be justified. We thank you, Father, for your love for us. You loved us from eternity. You loved us from the foundation of this world. And at the point, a point of time, you sent Christ to give us life that we may be saved. In him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. Father, for this we say thank you. We give you honor. We give you glory. We give you praise. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, thank you that the shed blood of Jesus has reconciled us to God. Made us your own. Brought us out of darkness into your kingdom, your marvelous light to show forth your praises, to show forth your excellences and your virtues. And so with hearts lifted up, hands lifted up, today, oh God, we give you honor in the sanctuary. We give you praise, worship, and adoration in the name of the Lord Jesus. Be thou magnified. Be thou glorified. Be glorified in each life, each family. In the name of Jesus, I pray for all in the sanctuary today. All over the world, people are with us. In this ministration and message, I pray for the move of God in their lives. I pray for the hand of God to deliver. I pray that you will seek and you will save. You will dispel fear in Jesus' name. Remove burdens from the hearts, the souls, the minds of God's people, from their emotions in Jesus' name. Father, stretch forth your hand, O God, and work signs, work miracles, work wonders. I declare the sick healed, the oppressed delivered in the name of Jesus. We thank you for signs and wonders that will follow your word to bring glory to God. As people are saved, they're healed, they're delivered, they're encouraged, they're lifted up. They find God's purpose for their lives and fulfill it. Father, for all that you do, be careful to give you alone all the honor, the glory, the praise, the worship, the adoration. Blessed be almighty God. In Jesus' name. And the people of God said, amen, amen, amen in the sanctuary and all around the world. Hallelujah. Can you give Jesus a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That means praise the Lord. Glory, 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 glory be to God. God bless you. God bless you. Praise God. You may be seated for those who are here in the sanctuary. Welcome to uh, today's service, World Missions Ministries Sunday service. I'm Pastor Anthony Turkson. It's my pleasure to bring to you God's word today. Amen. Jesus said in Luke chapter 19 that he came to seek and to save that which, which was lost. Luke 19, verses 9 and 10, we see that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. I'm going to call it Search and Rescue. Title today's message, Search and Rescue. Obviously, the search is for seeking, and the rescue is save. He came to seek and save. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. For, so for those who are obviously well versed in scripture, uh, you, you, 
prefer maybe seek and save, and that's fine. Praise God. Uh, but in addition, trying to reach a whole lot more people around the world who may not be familiar with scriptures. And so uh, today I use the title Search and Rescue. I think more people can relate to that. Search and Rescue. Sometimes there are uh, unfortunate events, tragedies around the world, natural disasters. It's because sin has come into our world and all creation groans, according to Romans 8, waiting for redemption. The day of redemption. <laughs> it's actually not only humans who need redemption, but all of God's creation. You ever actually think about that? All of God's creation, the natural creation has been messed up. That is why we have earthquakes that kill people. I'm sure sometimes people have those questions, you know, things that people call acts of God because people can't explain them, you know. A hundred-year flood is, you know, is a flood that just comes and wipes out a whole village, whole host of people and uh, people are like where was God what's going on um, that's because sin came to the world and sin has affected not only humans but has affected the natural creation itself and so even the natural creation is screaming out uh, if you had ears to hear trees and rivers <laughs> even animals if you had a way to hear them you would hear them groan for redemption Yes, 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 yes. Uh, we're used to, for example, maybe watching a nature channel and watching uh, lions, you know, chase their, their prey and uh, eat them up. But when you, when you read the Bible, uh, the Bible actually says even the young lions, they wait on God to feed them. <laughs> as powerful as they are, the king of, of the jungle looks to God. It's amazing because creation has changed. Um, when God, you know, uh, creates, uh, even, even before we have the new world, uh, new heavens, and, and the new earth, when Jesus comes to reign for a thousand years, scripture says that, you know, the lion and the lamb will lie together. The lion will not eat the lamb. There'll be absolute peace. So much peace that just takes over, not only humans, but animals. You think about it, a lion and a lamb, and a lion doesn't eat the lamb. It's just amazing, isn't it? Yeah, so creation has been affected. Um, why don't I just show you that scripture, and, and then I'm going to go to Luke 19. Just show you that scripture from Romans 8. Because we are, we are actually talking to the whole world right now. And the people are not familiar with a lot of the things that we know from Scripture. But they have questions. Some of you in your uh, outreach, you know, when you go to seek and save the lost, you, to minister to them, bring them to Christ. You get questions like this. Uh, so Romans 8 answers that. You know... Uh, why are there earthquakes? Why are there natural disasters? Why are some people born, and when they're born, they're born blind? Why? What happened? What did the child do? Why is the child's fault? Why some baby born has got water in the fluid in their brain? It's just blowing up the head. If doctors can't help, then what? Why do these things happen? People have these questions. And we have to understand the simple answer is this. Sin entered the world. Let's say God didn't make it that way. God didn't even create a devil. <laughs> he didn't create a devil. God didn't make you to be bad or do bad things. But you do bad things. But not you. The person next to you. No, no, not you. All right. Point I'm making is this. Human beings sin, but God didn't make us to sin. But we sin. Why? Because sin entered the world. In the scriptures, he says, I write these things to you that you sin not. This is my will for you, that you sin not. 
but he knows that you will sin. So he continues and he says, but if, if any sin, if any happen to sin, because I don't want you to stay in the state of sin, I didn't create you to be that way, I want you to quickly get out of it and walk with me. He says, I write these things to you that you sin not. But, he doesn't stop that God is so good, thank God. He says, but, if anyone sin, we have an advocate. You have a lawyer, you have an attorney, you have somebody who stands between you and the great God, the great judge of the universe. The holiest being of all. Who does not take sin, doesn't take nonsense at all. You do the crime, you pay the time. That's what the judge says. But you have a lawyer who will talk to the judge on your behalf. And that lawyer tells the judge, I gave my life for these sinners. I shed my blood for them. In fact, you are aware of it because you sent me and I agreed. And so on the basis of my sacrifice for them, vicariously for them, as a substitute for them, I was in their place. So when I died, they died. I paid for their sin. So as judge, you can no longer hold that against them. Jesus come and change God's dealings with humanity from being a God who judges us to a God who is merciful to us, who judges us because of sin, to God who is merciful to us because of the shed blood of Jesus. It's changed. Amen. The way God would have dealt with the world because of sin God as judge, he's still judge, but that relationship with us has changed because Christ has died and has been raised from the dead to die no more. Amen. He has paid the price for us. He came to seek and save those who are lost. He's paid the price for us. So God now deals with us based on the shed blood of Jesus. So he's looking at you as God who is merciful to you, not as God who is going to judge you for your sin because your sin has been paid for by the shed blood of Jesus. That's it. Amen. God has moved on. You can't go back to the previous scene. The scene has moved on. You can't unwind it. It's, he's moved on. It's changed. Praise the Lord. Can somebody tell me today's date? Right now in America, I'm not Australia, but this moment, what's today's date? 27th. We have moved from June 26th. You can never go back there. It will never happen. June 26th, 2021 will never happen again. Gone. Amen. God has washed away our sins. Gone. He would never deal with us based on our sins. The sins that Jesus paid for, he would never deal with us based on that. Psalm 102 says that. As a father deals with his children, so he deals with us. Now he's a father to us. He's a father to us. That means we are his children. When we're enemies of God, we're no longer enemies. We are his children. Amen. And he deals with us as a father. When we go astray, everybody may write us off. He is the only one who is still looking out for us. He leaves the light on so you can find your way back home. Amen. That's our father. Praise God. Loves you more than your mother. Mother wouldn't forsake you even if your earthly father did. A mother would be there. God says, my love is still deeper than a mother's love. I mean, that's, 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 that's amazing. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right, Romans 8. I'll quickly show you this. Romans 8. So you're going on evangelism. You're telling people about Jesus. You're asking all kinds of questions. So what would I, why, why is there so many problems? Why are there so many problems in this world? You know, what did this child do to have this autism? Why should a child be autistic? Not the child's sin, but Satan brought sin into our world. And sin has impacted the world. But God doesn't stop there. He searches and rescues. Amen? He searches and he rescues. 
just like if there's somebody put up a building, that humans will live in the building. The purpose for the building is that it will be used by humans. They'll be safe. They'll be protected from the elements. You know, it's a commercial building. You go to work there or some theater or the museum, you know, commercial place. Go and enjoy it. I mean, that was the intention. That was the purpose. God forbid the building falls down. All right? The building falls down. For whatever, there's gas explosion or there is, uh, I don't know, you know, the reba, the iron ruts were, were you know, uh, um, not strong enough. Somebody messed up. Whatever it was, building falls down. It is not God's fault. That happened because sin has come into this world. Satan is working in this world. And God does not stop there. He says, okay, well, Satan is working. No, no, no. He's always seeking, searching to rescue. And he'll use you. he use me. he use us. Praise God. So the building has come down. People have to go in to seek and rescue, search and rescue so that you save lives there. And as they are doing that, then we have Christians who are praying that some way, somehow, although this building has collapsed, somebody will be found. Somebody will survive. You pray. And maybe your prayer will give somebody the hope to just continue maybe tapping on a piece of iron. Just when they're about to give up, your prayer moves them to just, just make that one final sound that somebody just happens to hear. Oh, man. God's ways? Yes, he was seeking and save. Praise God. Those of you who, uh, two weeks ago, I think you heard uh, Reverend Janice use this example from the scriptures about a woman, uh, the Shunammite woman, who uh, wealthy woman, husband was wealthy. They had everything, but they had no child. And uh, they were in, were in touch with this. In fact, it was like an observation. Observed the ministry of this itinerant traveling minister, an itinerant traveling minister. He's called a prophet, Elisha. So he's been traveling around and... Uh, uh, they notice that. They're aware of it. But something more happens to the woman. The woman says, you know, let, let us the husband. I've noticed this preacher. He keeps coming through town. You know, that is, this is a circuit. He goes around here. It's just like in America, there was a time, uh, especially in the south or some places, there were some pastors who pastored like four churches. And they'll travel every month. They'll visit each church every month. You travel from Church A in Raleigh, then you go to Roanoke Rapids, then you go to this one, next one. You know, so every month, each uh, church sees them once a month. That is where they're four weeks, you know. Uh, sees them once a month. Yeah, they did that. And you think about what I'm just saying. So let's say this happens in North Carolina, in the United States. And the family says, you know, this minister is putting in a lot. Let's do something. <laughs> that happened. That happened in Shunem. It amazes me that, you know, this Elisha is doing this. He's doing all this work. And the Bible just records one family. That said, you know, let's do something to make this man's work easier. We don't need anything. We don't want anything. We just want to make sure the work of God is advanced. It's amazing how in this world, there's so many of us, but when things are going wrong, there are sometimes just very few who seek to search and rescue. There are very few people that it occurs to, what can I do to improve this situation? Don't you think so? There are a whole lot of us, billions of us in this world, but the number of people who actually make a difference in our world are very few. In the scriptures, God says, I'm seeking to see, to find if somebody is interceding. He said, there are problems in this world. 
the problems, that time it was Israel, just one nation. Now there are a whole lot of us, 198 or something like that. You know, but that's one nation that God was dealing with at the time. And they had problems, they had troubles. And God says, well, you know, things need to change. The earth has God given to men and their children. If things are going to change on this, in this world, you, we men need to do something. We can't just blame God. We need to do something. It will only change if you do something, of course, with God's help. But people have to do something. God is always seeking to save. God is always seeking to help. And God says, okay, I want to do something now in this situation in Israel. But I need a human being because I gave the earth to them. And I put them there so they have authority to be there. Did you just get that? If you live in a place, you are authorized to be there. All right, there's a reason why. There's something that shows you have authority to be there, a right to be there. If you have a right to be there, then you have the responsibility to take care of that there, that place. For example, if you're born in the United States of America, if you're born here, you have a right to be here, right? You know, this whole immigration thing. If you're born here, you have a right to be here. If you're not born here, you don't have a right to be here until you go through some other process they set aside for you to, be, to get the right to be here. But once you have a right to be here, you also have a responsibility for the place. Amen. Sometimes the problem with Christians is that, well, I'm just here. God, you do it. No, no, it's not God's responsibility. He put us here. He gave it to us. You take care of it. But some things you cannot do alone. You can't do by yourself. So you got to ask him for help. But God is always seeking to save. He's always on search and rescue missions. Always. He's in search and rescue mode all the time because we are needy people. Human beings are broken. Our, our lives are messed up. Messed up. <laughs> the example I was giving you about buildings. Why would buildings fall apart? Because of shoddy work sometimes. There are people listening to me right now in their homes who can relate to this. You gave a contract. You gave a contractor a job to do in your home. They didn't finish doing it, and you cannot find them. The phone number they gave you, you call the number, the number doesn't, it doesn't exist. There's no response. Or they may never answer. There are people right here who can say, Pastor, I attest to this. And they frustrate you to no end. You paid them. You gave them money. Hard-earned money. You worked overtime at times. Stressed out in traffic to get your money. And they took it away. And sometimes now you have to pay an attorney. Lose more money to try to get your money. This world, man, is messed up. But in all of that, God is still saying, I'm seeking to save. I am on, I'm, I'm in search and rescue mode. Because these people, they are messed up. But unfortunately, sometimes when he looks out, Scripture says he found nobody. But the good thing, ladies and gentlemen, praise God. The good thing about God is this. Even when he gave, made us responsible for our own lives and our earth, and we would not do it, and he's seeking for somebody to pray so that his hand will move, and he can't find anybody, Scripture says, okay, he came himself. Somebody say hallelujah. He said to Israel, I'm seeking for an intercessor. I found nobody. And then he said, I said to myself, I advised myself. I counseled myself because nobody counsels God. He said, I advised myself. I said to myself, okay, all right. I'll just have to go. So he came in the prayer I prayed. He came in the person of Jesus. I'm telling you, God is in search and rescue mode all the time. And he's, he's on search and rescue missions all the time. Whatever you're going through today, I'm here to tell you from the scriptures, the message is given me for you, is that God is seeking to save you. Amen. And by salvation, I don't mean just born again from your sins. Yes, that's, that's it. But also from all the effects of sin. Sin, as I was telling you, has impacted even the natural creation. 
And God is seeking to save us from sin's impact on the natural creation. See, you are born again, you are in this world, but you're not of the world. So you're still in enemy territory. So you go to heaven. Until you go to heaven, that enemy territory will try to impact your life. So even though God has made you born again through Christ, maybe last year, 10 years ago, some of you maybe 50 years ago, God is still today delivering you. Tomorrow he will deliver you. Hallelujah. He's still seeking you to save you. Somebody say, praise God. That's how he is. That is how God is. And you keep doing this. He's delivered us. He's delivering us. And you yet deliver us. You keep doing this till Jesus comes back for us. Amen. And until, of course, finally we have new heavens and a new earth. Wherein dwells absolute righteousness. Amen. But may you, may your heart, God do something in your heart today to turn you into the heart of that Shunammite who saw this man of God. And it's not just like a man of God or woman of God, but, you know, her mentality was, her mindset was God's work. God's work. So even if it's a 12-year-old, like Jesus in the temple at 12, 12-year-old, 12 you know, interested in the things of God, yes, look for how you can advance it. Yes. There were doctors of the law that Jesus was talking to when Jesus was 12. Which of them thought, hmm, maybe I need to mentor this boy. I wonder. I wonder. How many of you listen to me right now in the Christian world, in the world right now as I'm talking to you, in your church, maybe noticed a little boy, a little girl who's very curious about the things of God. Did it ever occur to you, maybe I need to look for maybe some pictures, picture books, whatever, something to help this child develop the skill? Did it ever occur to anybody? Are you gathering with Jesus or scattering? Jesus says, if you are not gathering with me, you are scattering. Not that you are evil, but if you are not gathering with me, you are, Jesus said, you are scattering. <laughs> Did you catch something on that? Yeah. You think, okay, I've been, I've been part of this church. I mean, I'm talking to the Christian world all over the world now. So you are in a church. You've been part of that church for five years. And you notice two or three children, they have this thing. And you happen to have training in that area. But for five years, you have not done anything about helping that child or those children progress in that area of the gifting that you noticed. Maybe I didn't notice, but you noticed it because it's, it's your area of expertise, your training or your gifting from God. So you would need to see what others don't see. But what have you done about it? And then beyond your church, your community, your community, or your country. It's very funny. You know, my kids tease me, and I guess, you know, a lot of uh, uh, kids uh, of immigrants tease their parents because we happen to live, we've, we've you know, we came to, a country that is not where we were originally born. They were born here, and they're living in two worlds because the training we provide them comes from how we were raised, and of course with scriptures, but they're in a different environment. And so they compare a lot of the training we provide and things we say with what they hear on television, uh, the friends talk about in school, in college, and, and they're, two, they're two different things. And sometimes they tease us, tease us a lot. You know, the things we say, our responses and all that. And you know, sometimes it makes me wonder. Uh, how, how are we going to help them? become all that God wants them to be in this new place 
That is actually new to us. I wonder, like, okay, what, what gaps are there in their life because we are learning in this new culture, this new society, and who could have come into their life from the society who grew up here to input certain things in their life to help them become all that God created them to be. You know, then on the other side, to I think, uh, what are the experiences that I've had from maybe traveling the world, being raised in a different society, ministering in different parts of the world, then now as a minister in the society, what things can I bring into the lives of people that God has given to me or brought to me to minister to, bring into their lives to Build them up. Like, I do the work of an apostle. When you're doing the work of an apostle, you know, you go to virgin territory, you raise up people. Right? You help them. God uses you to help them discover their calling, find their calling, fulfill their purpose. You train them. And in, in my case, I think about the same way I'm thinking about what our kids may have missed. Now I'm thinking about what God can use through me to impact people here to make them believers who see the world, who see beyond America. Because most of the Christians in America, I don't want, to, I don't want this to offend anybody, but most of the Christians here don't see the world. But Christianity, Jesus said, go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay. It's sometimes hard to teach these things uh, because people take offense. But I want you to just put on your, your spiritual thinking cap. Uh, you know, right now, America is like, when it comes to defense or military might, still the most powerful country in the world. Economically, maybe one or two, first or second, you know, sometimes now. In some areas, China, then America. Uh, depending on what economic figures you're looking at. And then other areas, still America one, then China two. But anyway, it's just amazing where this country has come from, how powerful it is and what God has done. For the country. But when you are like number one and the country is so big and you're so dominant, what happens is that your world is you. You know, you, you can spend all your life traveling through America and never have to go to any part of the world and you still will not see the whole of America. I mean, it's, it's that huge. It's that big. The variety is just beautiful. It's blessed. It's amazing. And economically wealthy. It's got more billionaires than any other country. More millionaires than any other country. China, not yet. I mean, it's just so powerful. So here's, here's the problem we have sometimes. Uh, when you're like number one, everything's about you. Like they say, you know, when America sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. When you're that powerful, you, you don't see anybody. It's just you. You know, when you play basketball, you know, NBA, National Basketball Association, and you win, you are called world champions. But it's called national. You just stay with me for a moment. It's national. When you, how, how does national become world? Baseball. They play baseball in Japan. They play baseball in America. You know what they call it? World Series. World, no, this is one country, but it's called world. Why? Because you dominate the world. You control the world. Then my kids are raised here. Your kids are raised here. Our grandchildren are raised here. So when you're not careful, what happens is that 
everything is just you. But you are born again. And the moment you're born again, life is not America only. And now I'm talking to especially the pastors and the ministers. Let me tell you this. The gospel is not Democrats and Republicans. But the spirit of the culture can so dominate you that you forget yourself and you think Christianity is America or America is Christian. No, Christianity is Jesus Christ. And he said, go into the whole world and preach the gospel to everybody. Search and rescue is for the whole world. It is not Democrats. It's not Republicans. So if you're a pastor here, if God sent you to me to train you, to raise you up, please don't lose your vision. And don't join the spirit of the world we have today. That has made Christianity. We've forgotten Christ. We have forgotten Christ. For most of us now, in our TV programs in America, Christian television, we've forgotten Christ. It is, it is not get people born again, discipled, following Jesus. Not anymore. It's something else. That is not the gospel. So that's why God sent me to you. To fill up that gap. To let you know that there is a world outside. Your pastor wasn't born yet, but God brought him here to minister the gospel of Jesus to you and to give you a reminder every Sunday that there is a world beyond the great United States that Jesus died for, that Jesus is seeking to save and rescue. And you have a responsibility. You cannot be in a church for five years, ten years, and you're gifted to minister to children and you do nothing about it. Or be in a community. You were trained by the federal government. You have this training, this expertise, and you're in this community for 20 years. Maybe you're, you're a computer genius. And nothing, you're a Christian, nothing will catch to you to think about starting something in that community to change children's lives when it comes to computer literacy. Come on, you're a born-again believer. What? What do we do? We just go to church, we pray, God, help me pay my mortgage, you know, give me a yacht, give me a plane, and that's, that's our Christianity. That is not seek and save. That is not search and rescue. But ladies and gentlemen, when you think of a search and rescue, it is life and death. Right now, in Florida, in Miami, Florida, this past weekend, or Thursday, a building came down, collapsed. And the people were working hard to rescue. That's life and death. That is not a joke. That is not a joke. For somebody to die, to go to hell, have an endless eternity without God, that is not a joke. You and I have been called to seek and save the lost as workers together with God to bring people to Christ. Amen? I hope I've helped you. This is my heart today. This is my heart. God put my heart, and I'm done with my message. Amen. We can go home now. I'm done. Praise God. But I was supposed to show you Romans 8, right? <laughs> Romans 8. 19. Romans 8. 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity. Not willingly. Not because he wanted it. But by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. I like that. 21. But the creature itself, or creation, if anybody be in Christ, is a new creature. That means a new creation. The word creature is the same as creation. 21, Romans 8, 21. Because the creation, creature of the creation itself, also 
itself also shall be what? Delivered from the bondage of corruption into what? The glorious liberty of the children of God. Romans 8, 22, please. For we know that the whole creation, you can underline that in your Bible, Romans 8, 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and travels in pain together until now. Verse 23, and not only they, but even we ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Born again people, even we also ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wait. That is the redemption of our body. We're groaning that we'll get new bodies. This corruptible body will become incorruptible because God did not originally create it to be corruptible. He didn't make the body to be mortal. But it's not mortal. It's subject to death. And so death still tries to impact it. And God is working daily to search and rescue your body. Yes. From death's impact. Sometimes through something that you read about how you should eat better or exercise, or whatever, anything. And that little word, that week, can change your life and stop, close the door to some operation of death that was coming. God shuts the door. Then you begin to apply that wisdom, that word that you read, or a friend told you about, and as you apply it, then the body begins to amend, the body begins to build up, but a lot of the time, Christians are actually not even thinking of these things as miracles from God. You know, because it was not like on a Sunday I was praying and hands were laid on me and I got a miracle, boom, no. We don't see that God was seeking to save us by sending that friend to tell us, oh, my doctor told me this or a friend told me this, that this vitamin or this fruit does this in the human body. That's what God created it for. That knowledge has now been given to you. It was given to you by God that particular week to stop death from coming. I don't mean death like, you know, your spirit leaves, cessation of your, your life on earth. No, but like some infirmity coming in to enter. And when it enters, it's not stopping and it enters, uh, it can begin to grow. Then, did I say that now? Let's see. Okay, yeah, this, we'll go to it. So, it can begin to grow, and then there are some, some aspects of life where maybe like a disease comes in, or an emotional problem comes in, or some kind of spiritual thing, and there are some, some times in life, what happens is that as something begins to grow, Physically or emotionally or mentally, unfortunately, a spirit can attach itself to that thing that started growing sometimes. Um, okay, let me go on. I, I, I'll explain. Uh, what happens is this. Uh, see, not every sickness is spirit. It's, it's, a, it's a demon. Not every sickness is a demon. Not every mental health issue is a demon. Not every emotional problem is demonic. No. But sometimes physical problems, sicknesses, become, are taken over by spirits. Sometimes emotional things are taken over. Spirit just comes in. Sometimes some marital problems is just not, disagreements or arguments of that, sometimes it gets to a point where 
a spirit then just comes in and takes over. So although the thing was just minor and it started in this corner, it takes a life of its own. Something else just takes over and it's out of the hands of humans. Now spirits begin to drive it. I don't know if it makes sense to you. I'll give you some scriptures to, to help explain that further. Now when spirits take over, then it just takes a, it's a different dimension now. It's a different, entirely different dimension. The marital problem is now not just disagreements. It's, it's a demon that's now moving the, the couple like on a chess board. And the player is moving the chess pieces. The chess pieces don't move themselves. You know, people move it. Even if it's computerized, there's another brain, you know, the computer that's moving it. So the human beings become like chess pieces, and a, and a spirit is moving them. Right. So now we go back here to the beginning where the thing started, and we're trying to use physical means to correct it, and it never changes because the dynamics has changed. Now we're at a point where it's spiritual. So to bring a healing, a deliverance, a rescue, we need to deal with the spirit. When you remove the spirit, then there's no life or energy pushing, propelling this problem. All right? Then we can come to the counselor. And the counselor, you know, in the multitude of counseling, there, there's safety, there's salvation, there's deliverance, there's prosperity. Then you apply whatever it is they're telling you, and once you begin to apply it, and things begin to work, then you breathe. Then you begin to grow. Amen. But before you begin to breathe and grow and build, there must be an uprooting. Until there's an uprooting and a clearing of the debris, you're going nowhere. You're just going, going in circles. I don't know if it makes sense to you. Yeah. Building collapses here to rebuild. We have to clear the debris. Clear everything before, you know, the ground is prepared, whatever. Maybe they do soil testing. So they know how to build this time. Yeah. Am I helping you? So when a spirit takes over the sickness situation to deal with it, we have to cast the spirit out. Drive the spirit out. Deliver the person from the spirit of infirmity. Then, so for ministry, when your ministry is a demonic problem, before you pray for the healing, command the spirit to leave. Then you speak to the body to have life. You understand the difference? Amen? Yeah. Unless the tree is killed, the bad tree, I mean, is killed at the root, you chop up the branches, new branch will come, and it's going to be another fruit. Yeah. That's like with a child. The child, you see the child is beginning to bear certain fruit. That is not good. Age three, age five, or age nine, or whatever. You know, just add a few more years to it. You know, what's it going to be like at 15, age 17? Then they're 26. Then they're 31. Now they're married to somebody. And that behavior, you didn't change at three. You didn't change at five. It's manifesting. And they're, they're messing somebody's child's life up as well as theirs. And it started with you in the home. You saw it and you never corrected it. Search and rescue. Search and rescue your children and grandchildren, nieces and nephews. Now, search and rescue. Some of you, your parents, your siblings, won't want you involved. They don't want to hear about your Christianity. It doesn't matter. You deal with it spiritually because you see something in your nephew that's not of God. Don't just gossip. Don't just talk about it. Don't just complain. You've grown. You've been taught enough. At this point, you should not be gossiping and just complaining about your family members. I want to hear you deal with the spirit. Cast the spirit out of that nephew. They don't have to be there with you. Their, their, their parents will be offended. So don't do it in their presence. And never tell them that there's a demon working in your child now. Because, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes they're demons. Man, that is something that hurts in life. To admit 
that your family member is a witch. <laughs> you ever dealt with a witch before? I'm, I'm a minister and I've dealt with that. That witch is somebody's relative. You ever think about that? Some of you work with people who are wizards. They're demonized people, but they are married. <laughs> yeah, human lives. They're married, tormented. The way they torment you at home, at work. Imagine what the person they're married to go through, goes through. Search and rescue. Jesus said, go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. Search and rescue does not stop till we go to heaven. What is your role? What is your part? Okay, so let me show you. Let me show you scriptures. Yeah, I got some time. Let me show you some scriptures. Let's go to Luke 19, 9 and 10. Luke 19, 9 and 10. Hallelujah. Is it heavy? Today, are you okay? Are you okay? All right. Luke 19, 9 and 10. Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. Verse 10, verse 10. For, because the reason why you have salvation today, why? It's because a son of man is come, is present, he's here now, to seek and to save that which was lost. Seek and save is search and rescue. Save is the same as rescue. To be saved comes from the Greek word sozo. Sozo, S-O-Z-O, or some spell it S-O-D-Z-O. It means deliverance from sin and the effects of sin. So when you're born again, our sins are forgiven. They are washed away, in fact. Without the shedding of the blood of Jesus, there's no remission of sin. So our sins are removed. They're gone. As far as the east is from the west, so has God set our sins away from us. Last week, Sunday, the pastor, who's also an engineer, I love, I love him when he ministers. Because I always learn not only from the script, uh, scriptures, but something also that, you know, I don't know. And he used this example, Pastor, Pastor Joe was preaching, he said, and it's from Psalm 103. God says, as far as the east is from the west. So same place I quoted, that he deals with us, not after our sins, but as a father. Amen. You know how mothers deal with children? A mother's child is never wrong. A mother's child is perfect. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Oh, fathers may leave, but mothers never leave. But God says, even a mother can leave, but I will never leave. Amen. And the thing with God is that if his children mess up, he says, that's my child. I deal with my child. I don't let the devil destroy my child. Amen. Forget that wrong teaching that God is judging you and he's just letting the devil do this and that to you. That's, that's, that's not God. It's changed. Now he meets with us at the throne of grace and mercy. Come on, people. Not as your judge, as your father. Jesus changed it. Amen? Do you get that? Okay. All right. So, anyway, Jesus says he came to seek and save, search and rescue. He saved us from sin in our spirit. We're born again instantly. But your soul is now born again. Your mind, your emotions, they're now born again. Your will is now born again. <laughs> right? It's not. I know some of you are very perfect. God bless you. A lot of us are still working our way there. Amen? <laughs> you are not perfect. You know that. Jesus is always perfect. <laughs> Praise God. His blood is perfect. His sacrifice is perfect. That's also another area I need for the preachers and teachers here. If you're going to represent Christ and mount this podium to teach people, I need you to get this. Stop teaching that people are perfect. You can take, say that in your home. But when I give you an opportunity to preach here, don't say that. 
because that is not biblical. No human being is perfect. The blood of Jesus is perfect. What God required, the sacrifice that God required to make us born again is perfect. Amen. So our salvation is perfected, but the human being is not yet perfected. You have to get the difference. Please don't do that because I don't want to be sitting there and you're preaching here and I have a face like I'm baptizing vinegar and I'm, you know, cringing and I'm, no, please don't do that to me. Don't do that. It's not scriptural. Just like I taught, I taught today from when I started preaching. I said, the Lord said, I write this unto you that you don't sin. If you were perfect, you wouldn't even say that. Come on, people, do you get the scriptures? I write it unto you so that you do not sin. If you were perfect, therefore incapable of sinning, he would not even say that to you. Then he says, but if any sin, we have an advocate. So, saints still sin. So don't you tell me you are perfect, and please don't preach it here. You can say that if you're not going to listen to what I'm saying. That's fine. You're an adult, you're grown, you can say that in your home. But don't teach it, not in church, not in the Bible. Don't do that. Because if you do that, I'll stop you. And I will not let you preach again. Until you change that rotten, stinking thinking. It is not biblical. It is not scriptural. Jesus is perfect. His blood is perfect. The sacrifice is perfect. But what it did was change us in our spirit. So your spirit will never become more born again, ever again. It is complete and entire. But you are a tripartite being. You are trichotomy. You are three in one. You are a spirit being who lives in a body and has a soul. You are a spirit being who lives in a body and you have a soul. Your soul is now born again. Your soul needs to be restored. It needs to be rescued. It needs to be reclaimed through the word of God and by the spirit of God. So does your body. So as death from the world system tries to impact your body and your soul, the Lord continues to seek and rescue, to search and rescue, seek and save. Please, you get that? Amen. Emotionally, he will seek you and he will rescue you. The word of the Lord is pure. Doing what to the soul? Psalm 19, tell me. The word of the Lord is pure, con- converting the soul. Converting the soul. That's like your spirit was converted. Now your soul needs to what? Change. Don't be conformed to this world. If you are perfect, he would not tell you, don't be conformed to this world. But be ye transformed through the renewing of your mind, the changing of your mind. That you may prove what is that perfect, acceptable, the good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed, transformed by the changing of your mind. That is, he's rescuing you from bad thinking. Because as you think, so will you act. And after a while, that action, that action becomes your destiny. Yeah. Yeah. That action will take you to a certain direction, certain pathway, and you end up somewhere. So he wants to change the thinking. Amen? Don't be just hearers of the word. Be doers of the word. James 1. Amen? Okay, so let's go to... Uh, let's, let's, let's stay in Luke. Let's go to Luke 15. 
Luke 15. Search and rescue. Luke 15. If I don't finish this, I'm not going to finish, so we'll continue next week. But look at uh, Luke 15, please. Tell me if you see, please, if you see search and rescue here. Luke 15, reading from verse 1. Then drew near... Unto him all the publicans and sinners to hear him. The publicans uh, considered like the chief sinners, you know. Uh, there were government officials who took people's money. <laughs> uh, that's like, uh, <laughs> I'll leave that alone. But as a man, there's a lot of corruption in other places in the world. Just to do their job, you got to pay them under the table for them to do their job. <sighs> anyway, verse 2, And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and, and eats with them. <laughs> That's like American Christianity right now. See how much we judge people? We consider our sinners. Left wing sinners. <laughs> I have to say that so you, you understand what I'm talking about. Left wing sinners. Is it left wing? Uh, right now, in American culture, left wing people are the sinners. And right, right or far, the far right are like the most Christians, yeah? The far right conservatives. That, that's the definition of Christianity. Come on, people. Christianity is not America. Christianity is Christ. And it started from Israel, Middle East, you know. And it started from the Bible Belt of America. Come on, people. Stop looking at Christianity that way. You know, the, the world is big. There are more people all over the world than just us here. You need to stop thinking like a Pharisee, being judgmental. You cannot save them that way. We will not get things to change in America if we're just judgmental of Democrats or Republicans or whatever perceptions we have. Something needs to change, ladies and gentlemen, especially right here in our house. Let me start from my house, our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. We, something needs to change. We need to, we need to recover ourselves. Come back to your first love, who was Christ. Come back. Let's come back. Anyway, verse 3, he spoke this parable to them saying, watch the search and rescue, please. Verse, verse, now verse 4. What man of you, this is Jesus, which of you having a hundred sheep? You know what? Let me read from a different version. That was Luke, right? Just give me a minute, please. Luke 15. Where did I get to? Verse 4. Okay. He told them this parable saying, what man among you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, search and rescue, right? Losing one of them does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. Let's go find the Republicans. Let's go find the Democrats. Let's go find all the people, God's people, please. When he's found it, he plays on his shoulder rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. Likewise, similarly, same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous men who need no repentance. Look at God. 
God says here, all the rest of you conservative Christians, the 99, says, I'm happy about you. You don't need repentance. You're okay. That one, that's lost. Go seek and find them. The focus is not on you who are okay. The focus is on the person who is not. The healthy don't need a physician. You know what the Bible says? It's the sick that need a physician. The focus is be on the sick. Let's save them. Let's kill them. Let's heal them. Let's pray for God's power into their lives. Amen. Okay, continue. Another example. It's interesting. He didn't stop with just that example. Give some another one. Second example. So first example actually is, uh, you know, the sheep that was lost that uh, had to be rescued. You go search, you seek, and you find it. Now, the second example is uh, a property. Uh, appears to be uh, a material thing, but it's important to the person. Verse 8, it's there. Let's read it. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, and losing one, does not light a candle and sweep the house and search diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. Similarly, same way, likewise, I tell you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. So he uses a story to teach about eternal life, rescuing the perishing. Amen. I want us to dig out some practical things in this portion. The second example that Jesus gave. I don't have time to get into the third one. Maybe we'll do that next week. But it's interesting. Our Lord did not stop with this second one. He told them a, a, a third example. <laughs> it's like, he's like saying the first one is not, it's not enough. Second one. Then the third one. The third one, of course, you know the story of the prodigal son. So that's relationship. God is saying the relationship will be rescued. Come on, people. We'll do that one next week. All right? The relationship will be rescued. That was a family relationship. Father, son, and the son and his brother. And even the household, the servants, how they perceive the father's love. The relationship between the brothers, what's going on in the family, how it impacts the servants who were to be reached with the covenant that God had with that family. Your employees, they have to be reached by you. They don't come to clean your house, and that's it. You're a believer. What's your witness? Are you gathering or scattering? What's your testimony? You and your husband are always screaming and fighting, and your housekeeper is like, <laughs> they're about to go to church. They, they call their girlfriend. They are to take it. You know those people? They got their big Bibles. They're going to church. They almost killed each other. Are you gathering or scattering? Ask yourself that. Think it's a good testimony. It's not. It's not a good testimony. It's not at all. It's not at all. How does God feel when there's venom from Christians against fellow Americans? How does God feel about it? Listen, gentlemen, I'm calling us to change. Maybe you would not want me to be your pastor from today. <laughs> My heart is heavy with this subject. Something needs to change. Sometimes I think we're too afraid. Afraid for our own 
lives, our own ministries. So we don't address the elephant in the room. I used to wonder why, how Hitler was able to get away with what he did. And these times have shown me why. People are just cowards. People are too selfish. The people who could have stopped that man in that day, but they were afraid for their life, they are afraid for their property, they are afraid for whatever. Costs the world too much. And it's still costing us. Still. Still. My brother was doing a, was working in Germany. At the time, lived in London as a consultant. Go to work for the week and then come back to London where he lived. So go Monday, come back Friday. One day after work, these guys almost killed him. They're driving and they're just driving off the road to hit him because he's black because of the color of his skin. And today we are told, don't talk about it. But I'm black all the time, am I not? <laughs> That's the house in which I live. And if something impacts me, I have to say something. Search and rescue. So we'll do the relationship part next week. Let's talk about this woman. Luke 15. Luke 15, verse 8. So just think about yourself as that woman. Even if you're male, you know, maybe you lost something. God is telling you in this story, you recover what you lost. That's what God is saying here. You recover it. Oh, yes. Come on, people. God is in, he's in search and rescue mode all the time. I want you to remember that. And he's on a search and rescue mission all the time. Your spirit, your soul, your body, your entire being. May the very God of peace sanctify you completely, entirely, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, your whole spirit, soul, and body. God will bless you. God will help you. He will do it. Amen. He would do it. Praise the Lord. So Luke 15, verse 8. So which of you, you had 10 silver coins. You lost one. What did she do? Let's pick it out. What did she do? She says that she did. When that happens, when you've lost something valuable to you, the first thing you do in the scripture, according to Jesus, light a candle, right? That's verse 8. Does everybody see it? Light a candle. What does that represent? It represents a word. The word of God is light unto our feet. Amen. It's a lamp to my feet now and light to my pathway. Psalm 119 and verse 105. I repeat it for you taking notes. Psalm 119 verse 105. 105. Psalm 119, verse 105. The word of God is lamp to my feet pos pos uh, positionally right now. And then direction, pathway, all right, is light for my path. Amen. All right, so whatever is missing, you need to bring the word of God in, in that situation. Now, you need to look for scriptures, promises, words from God that relate to that situation, whatever it may be. Amen. Thank God for technology. You can Google it. Use your concordance. Look up words that relate to whatever is missing. And have a piece of paper or a way to record those scriptures that relate to that. Let's say you end up with 10, 12. It doesn't matter. Go over. If the Bible gave you 10 references, you write them down. Then pray. Then go over the references again. When you pray and you go over the references, the Spirit of the Lord will highlight the references that relate to your situation, your particular situation, that are applicable to you for that case. So maybe one, two, or three scriptures will be highlighted. 
they'll stir up your heart. Your heart will be on fire more than the other scriptures about that. When you sense that excitement within, your heart is bubbling. The scripture is speaking to that situation and your mind is just running fast. You know God's talking to you. Did you get how I explained it? Hello, you're a little quiet. Did you get that? Okay. So you notice maybe two, one, two, or three scriptures. That means God is saying zero in on those. Study them again. Think about them. That's meditation. Think about those scriptures. That's lighting the candle into that situation. You are dispelling the darkness. I prayed for that already. You are dispelling the darkness in that particular, with that particular problem. Amen? You're bringing word in to enlighten you. In his light shall we see light. People perish for lack of knowledge. So now that the word is coming in, you will not perish. We will rescue the perishing by bringing the light of God's word in. Do you get that? It doesn't matter what, whether it's coins, about material things. So that's finance. So find finance-related scriptures and finance-related information. It's family. Find scriptures related to family, marriage, whatever. Health, eating right. Exercise. Even the Bible talks about exercise. Bodily exercise profits a little. Find that. Then apply it. Everybody gets this. You're on a recovery mission. Rescue recovery. What's the next thing she does? She lights a candle and she sweeps the house. Sweep. So let's break that down. So when we, we sweep, you know, you're sweeping your house. Let's just make it simple. Why, why are you doing that? To make it clean. All right, so maybe you're sweeping dirt out, yes? Some fluff came in, dust came in, the floor is dirty, child spilled something, whatever. See, so sometimes in life we have dirt that comes in. You go to work from morning till evening. By the time you come home, dealing with people, the world, some dirt may have come in somehow. And it needs to be swept out. You understand this? Okay. Then she searches diligently. Diligence. Let me just take you quickly to Matthew 12. I'm going to come right back. Let me take you to Matthew 12. I need to show you this before we pray. Matthew 12. I'm going to cut it short here so we can, we can pray. Next week I'll, I'll teach some more. We'll come to Matthew 12, 43 to 45. So for internet, uh, to put the verses up, Matthew 12, what we're doing is 43 to 45. That's going to explain what we're looking at in, what, what did I just leave? We're just in Luke, what were we? Luke 15, right? Okay, so Matthew 12 is going to shed a little bit more light on this. Matthew 12, what, would, what verse did I give you? 43, thank you. So Matthew 12, 43. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through... Okay, now this is not my Bible. I know. You forgive me. I have to do King James. All right. Yeah, it didn't sound like... Okay. Matthew 12, 43. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking what? Rest and finds none. 44. Then he says, I will return into my house. I've always been annoyed about that. A demon calling a human being in its house. From whence I came out. And when he's come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. Thank you. Now let me go to this other version. I know why I brought it. This other version. Uh, it says, well, we just read verse 44. Then it says, I return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it empty, swept, 
and put in order. Put in order. Then it goes and brings with itself seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Don't let it disturb you. Let's finish it. So shall it be also with this evil generation. What we just read happens to wicked or evil people. It doesn't happen to you. Come on, people. Did you just get that? Jesus just teaching this. Don't let somebody read this and confuse you with it, make you scared and think, you know, demons just going to be running into your house, running into your life. No. He said this thing, this phenomena happens to people who live in wickedness, who are evil. That means they have created open doors for the devil to go in and out. Did you just get that? Don't be afraid. Sometimes pastors don't want to teach certain things because people, people just, people just fearful. And you, if you're born again, you shouldn't be fearful. And you should not you should be able to tackle the word. If God wrote it, you need to deal with it. It's here. It's just like this thing that people, pastors, we've made this mistake. Make God's people think that like the end times should not be studied. So when are we going to read it? In heaven? No. It's here. Now. But why is it that pastors say that? It's not important. It's not even about being born again. So why did Jesus talk about it? It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in Luke, it's in John. Why did Paul talk about it? In many epistles. James talks about it. John talks about it. Then you go to the Old Testament. Daniel spends chapters about it. Ezekiel spends chapters. Isaiah talks about it. Job talked about it. And then we come up and we say, oh, no, no, it's not important. Really? So why does the book of Revelation start and it says, blessed is the person who reads this. It even bothers to tell you you are blessed if you read it. And today, we don't read it. And the pastors who are supposed to teach us tell us, oh, it's not important. Today, you've been rescued. I have searched for you, and you've been rescued. Your mind has been rescued. Because there are some things we have to learn that will change how we live. If you read about the end times, you know how the world is going to end. The Bible says it changes your behavior, your conduct. Yes, has to be taught so that you walk on the completed. You walk on the straight and narrow, the Jesus way. Amen? Okay. So what is the demon looking for? The demon is looking for a house that is empty. And we'll talk about it next week. Also looking for something that is clean so it can make it unclean. It's looking for something that is orderly so it can make it disorderly. But we'll look at that part next week. We'll pray today using this. What will stop it? What will stop this demon from coming back is when the place is no longer empty. That is the only difference. All right? If it's orderly, garnished, beautiful, it wants to make it disorderly. If it is a house that It comes and it finds that it is clean. It wants to make it unclean. So if it's clean, it can make it unclean. If it is orderly, it can make it disorderly. The only thing that it cannot do is when it is occupied. Did I help you? The unclean spirit is looking for a man's life to enter and live there, make it disorderly, disorganized, unclean, mess it up. When it comes and it finds it empty, it's happy. Oh, there's nobody there occupying it or that area.
How can a believer be empty? A believer is not empty. A believer has the Holy Spirit. So you're not empty. Not in your spirit. But in an aspect of your mind, if, you're, if that area is empty or devoid of God's truth, God's word, a demon can move in. It's not going to possess your spirit. You're not possessed. But it can mess you up in your thinking, mess you up in your mind. It can harass you, torment you mentally. So I'm going to end here. I want to pray. Next week, I'm going to talk more about this. And this is what we're going to use in prayer. Take you back to Luke, right? And we'll use this in prayer. Come back this time to Luke 13, please. Luke 13. All right, so you're going to Luke 13. We're going to use this to pray now. And as you go in there, I'm just going to quote again, uh, refresh you. Remember Luke 19, Jesus said in verses 9 and 10, This day salvation has come to this man because he is a son of Abraham, right? This day salvation has come to you because I have come to seek and save, search and rescue. And that person was Zacchaeus. And he needed to be saved because he was a son of Abraham. Remember we just read, we read that today, Luke 19, 9 and 10. Do you remember that? Okay. Jesus said he had to be saved because he was a word, a word of Abraham. Son of Abraham. That was Luke 19, 9 and 10. Now look, look at this. Luke 13, verse 11. I'm sorry, verse 10. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Verse 11. Behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. Bowed together, could not lift herself up. When Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said, Woman, you are loose from your infirmity. If somebody is bowed together and cannot lift themselves up, or let's say somebody is crippled, cannot lift themselves, you can picture it, right? They can't stand up. They can't walk. She's bowed together, cannot lift herself up. So maybe her, her, her spine is curved. You know, some osteo something, you know, and something of a bone, you know, so she can't. Just lift yourself up. But Jesus does not address the physical problem, as I was telling you earlier today. He does not deal with the physical problem. He deals with the spiritual problem. You have to deal with the root of the tree. Yes? Remember the marriage example I was, I was saying, you're disagreeing about whatever, water cooler, or I don't know, coffee. But later on, a demon moves into their marriage, a demon of confusion. Talk about that next week. We can talk about relationships. Or a family issue, the brothers, a demon moved in. You know, anyway. So how do you deal with that? In this case, Jesus addressed the woman's physical problem from a spiritual perspective. Woman, you are loose from your infirmity. Then 13, he laid his hands on her. So ministers, notice, before the laying on of hands, what happened first? Deliverance. Come on, people, you see it? All right. Lays hands, and me, immediately she's made straight and glorifies God. Then, you know, people, these Pharisee people, they don't care about people being free. They just care about rules and laws. So they're complaining. Then Jesus goes to um, verse 15. The Lord answers and said, You hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath releases? ox or his donkey from the stone leads him away to watering. Search and rescue. If your donkey fell in a pit and it was a Sabbath, will you let it die? No, you won't let it die because that's how you get your money. Donkey works for you. <laughs> you're thinking about yourself. You're going to save it. That's by the law. People can be really selfish. Look at this. Verse 16, finally. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound these 18 years, be what? Loosed from this bondage on the Sabbath day. So her, her back, she had a back problem. She could not raise herself. But Jesus said it was, a, it was spiritual bondage. So some sicknesses are spirits causing that sickness. Some emotional things you have. Some mental things are actually demons. Not all of them. You need to deal with the demon first. 
Then you need to lay hands next. Amen? Then you need to set things in order by bringing in the word of God, get counsel and bring the word in place and begin to arrange, set the house in order. And as the word is coming in, you're filling that part of the mind, that part of the emotion, you're filling it with God's word. Now that it's full of God, let the word of God dwell in you richly, speaking to yourself. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So now that you're full, when that demon that was there, that was cast out of this woman, when it comes back, the place is now no longer empty. It's full. Do you get it? Amen? All right. So we're going to pray. We're going to pray for people to be rescued and to be delivered. This week, God gave me a vision. I saw this woman, um, and, and to me, she was in her 30s. I said to myself, look, maybe like 35. That, obviously, I'm not sure exactly, but human, you know, looked to me like. Excuse me. I'm saying this to help you uh, figure out revelations and when you're working together with God because he's on a search and rescue. And in some cases, he's going to rescue people by showing you visions, dreams, word of knowledge, that kind of thing. So this week, he shows me this. I see this woman uh, curled up, you know, balled up in a fetal position on her bed. Uh, this woman that God delivered in, in the dream, I mean in the vision. Uh, so, you know, I pray for her. Well, after this vision, after prayer, this week subsequently, there's a prayer topic that comes up, some emergency that comes up, and there happens to be a woman, uh, you know, in a, in a situation that's very similar, as far as I'm concerned, to the vision that God gave me. Uh, I saw this spiritually, but my mind didn't have all the details. So I actually called, I called the person who told us about a prayer re request. I called back asking questions because I wanted to know for sure, was that the woman that I saw? And the, and the reason why I, I, was, I did that was so that um, next time when God shows me something, I'd be in a better position. So I, I figured, well, my mind needs some information. So I asked questions. Is this, this, is that? Based on what I'd seen, I asked questions and to just be sure that this was the person. Anyway, we thank God for, for that deliverance. So if you see a vision, if you see a dream, God shows you something. All right. We only see in part. We know in part. You don't know it all. You don't know it all. So, in fact, I asked the person, what's the age? And I had to explain. You know, you know women don't like to tell their age, you know. So I had to explain myself. I, I've seen something spiritually. I'm trying to figure out if that's the person. That's why I'm asking the, for the age. But the person was in their 30s. And to me, I would say maybe like 35. Now, that I can be wrong because that's my estimation. God didn't say they're 35. It looked to me like they're in 30s. I figure maybe. Anyway, they told me and, and then said to me, that's the person you know, God showed you. Anyway, we thank God for the deliverance. I want to pray with you. Uh, some of you may have seen visions, dreams. Some of you are going through things with family members. And as I chastise you a little bit as a pastor, if you, because the thing with family is that sometimes things are upset and annoying, and we just complain. We gossip or complain, even as Christians, instead of praying. So if you're complaining about something with family, nieces, nephew, whatever. Today we're going to pray. Amen? I'm going to lead you in prayer so that that spirit that has entered that house, isn't that annoying for a spirit to say, I'll go back to my house? That just annoys me. We're going to drive them out in Jesus' name. Then we're going to do Luke 13. Jesus said to the spirit, to the woman, you are released from this infirmity. In other words, demon, get out. Woman, you are free. Then he laid his hands. Amen. Can you stand with me, please? Those in the sanctuary. Everybody around the world, let's just go to God in prayer right now. I'm going to pray first for you, then we're going to pray together. So you can just open your hand wherever you are, uh, like you're receiving, you're taking. That's represent receiving from God. Amen. Praise God.
And if it say a husband and wife and God addressed, I know I said next week we talk about relationships more, but maybe God spoke to you already. And you're in your home right now. Husbands and wives, you can just join hands. Or maybe God spoke to you today something about a child and there's a spirit that's trying to move in. Maybe there's just a natural problem. But now a demon is saying, I'll go back into that house. So you have picked something up in your spirit that a demon is trying to move into this area of my son's education or my son's soul. All right, I want you to put your hand on that son or that daughter in that house, wherever you are watching me right now. Right now, just put your hand on that child. Right, we're going to release God's power. We're going to release love and power in the name of the Lord Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. I want you to have that emotion. Emotion, yes, I mean emotion. And that spirit of love. We're not opposed to anybody. We want to seek and save. We want to search and rescue. That's what's important. A building has collapsed. We need to save people. It doesn't matter if that boy did it, if that daughter did it. It doesn't matter if the contractor messed up. What matters is let's put it right. Are you ready in your homes? Are you ready in the name of the Lord Jesus? The solution is Christ. The deliverance is Christ. The deliverer is Christ. The healer is Christ. The savior is Christ. In the name of Jesus, in the matchless name of Jesus, I take divine authority right now over that demon, those spirits that say, I will enter into that clean place. I'll enter into that place of order and I'll make it unclean and disorderly. I come against you in the name of Jesus. I break your power over lives. I command you, get out, out of that home, out of that marriage, out of that boy's life, out of that girl's life, come out in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Today, salvation has come to your house because you are a son of Abraham by faith in Jesus. Because you are a daughter of Abraham by faith in Jesus. Right now, be rescued. Be delivered. Be saved in the name of Jesus. I pray for anybody who's balled up in the fetal position. Anyone whose chest is being impacted. Your breath and breathing being impacted. Your respiratory organs impacted by the devil. Any spirit of death coming against you. I rebuke that spirit. Any attack to your physical body or your soul or your spiritual life. I break the power of darkness. I break the power of the devil. Let the true light shine of Jesus. Be healed. Be loosed. Be delivered in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I pray people into the kingdom. I pray you to Christ. That you receive salvation from sin and all the effects of sin. In Jesus' name, be saved, be saved, be healed, be delivered. And now, let every empty place be filled with the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Word of God, the truth of God. In Jesus' mighty name, by the faith of God, I call it down in Jesus' name. Amen. Now lift your voice together and let's pray. In your home, begin to pray all around the world. Begin to pray now. Yes, begin to pray. You pray. Pray to God. You're not listening to me. God, God is listening to us. We are all praying to God. So in your own language, wherever you are, pray to God. God understands. Start by saying, I give my life to you, Jesus. If you've never done that, say, Lord, I give my life to you. Jesus, come into my house, into my life. Now, please say that first. Then you say, Lord, fill my house and every part of me, spirit, soul, and body with your presence. Fill me so no spirit can move in in the name of the Lord Jesus. Pray that. And then whatever area you need rescue, like that woman, she lost silver coins. Maybe financial rescue. Pray for that. 
Relational, it doesn't matter what. You know it, you pray. So everybody pray. Pray in English, French, Spanish, your own language. Pray in tongues. Let's pray to God. Come on, lift your voice, especially in the sanctuary. I want all the boys and the girls to pray. Young men, young women, you pray also. Pray about your life. Pray about your education. Pray that your spirit, your mind, your emotions will be filled with God and God's word. Not things that will destroy your life. Let's pray, everybody, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, as we pray, fill every vacuum. Fill the emptiness. Fill the empty areas. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Makatali birikatoria. Leri maturi baturi bazaya. Ikrando lozinde barinda bakayas. Leri baturi baande zabiri bikaya. Iyando lobozi bikanto la brikatoya. Leri indaita zuri bahanda bakaya. Leri bandu zabani mikaya baduri. Lerendo zata Bakuri Bahandas, May Ivamandu Zaita Ladi Mituri, A Lady Bakuri Bazaita, Lady Bahaya, Make a fighter Zaita fighter, A Lady Bikaita Zaita, Maita Zaita fighter, He made a Zaita fighter biter, His Andoli Bikata fighter, Hey Pa Andolo Brosti Bihantaya, Ilibi Hanta Kaya, Ilabahanta Baya, Ibahanta Baya Kandori Tasaya. Please pray right now. It's easier to pray when we are praying. It's easier to pray when the Spirit is moving us than for you to say, I'll do that later. Do it now. In the name of Jesus. I pray, mighty Holy Spirit, that you fill all empty vessels. Fill us, fill us, fill us, fill us. Spirit, soul, and body. Fill Till there's no room for any spirit to enter. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Please keep praying. Keep praying. We're praying to God, so you don't need to interpret my tongues or my prayer. Yandele bebe kapanta baba kapaya ila baba takaya baya 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 ila baba katala baya baya ika bada baya pata kaya ile bebe kata zaya ile bebe pata zaya ila bakando zata pare ila batari bikata baya hey satala baba ntori bikaya Jesus name Jesus name Thank you Lord Jesus Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, our final prayer in the sanctuary, not final for today, because the Lord will give you other things to pray about on your way home or when you get home or later tonight, whenever there'll be more. But our final prayer here in the sanctuary is for rest. For rest. Remember, the demon, according to Jesus, the te- in the teaching in Matthew 12, the de- even the demon was seeking rest. When the demon was cast out of the man, it was walking around in dry places, seeking rest, finding none. So it was only at rest in the man's life because a man is supposed to be at rest. God created us to rest. That's why when Jesus came in Matthew 11, he said, come unto me all that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Rest. Rest. Even a demon was looking for rest. So I'm going to ask you, you can put your hand on your head if you want. That is to cover from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Or you can still raise your hand to God. It doesn't matter. But at least do something. Do something. And to make it easy, as a point of contact, put your hand on your head. Jesus wore a crown of thorns 
So you wear a crown of glory and you have peace of mind. Just put your hand on your head. It represents your crown from your head to the soles of your feet. You are covered. I pray for restoration of your soul. Rest in your whole being. I pray for your mind to be made whole. I pray for that. Torment and fear. Leave in Jesus' name. Mind be made whole. Mind be made whole. I pray for your mental health right now. Be made whole. You have the mind of Christ. I pray forgetfulness out. I pray forgetfulness, all illnesses related to that, away from you. Young people, you be sharp. I pray for academic excellence. I come against Alzheimer's. I come against diseases of the brain and of the mind. In the name of Jesus, you have the mind of Christ. May you have rest. The very God of peace, of shalom, give you rest today. On your Sabbath day, Sabbath is rest. Today, Christ, your rest gives you rest. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, be made whole. In Jesus' name, receive rest. Receive rest. Receive rest. Receive rest. Receive rest. You can put your hand on your chest if you want to. I pray life into you. Live. May the breath of God enter you. Live. Health to your respiratory system. Live. 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 I pray for your emotions, broken hearts, heart issues, physical heart, and your spiritual heart, and emotional problems. Be made whole in Jesus' mighty name. I pray for rest, 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 rest in the name of Jesus. The breastplate of righteousness will be put on to stop the arrows that are shot at you. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. No arrow shot at you by day or by night will strike you. We cut it off. We condemn it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Now receive this prophetic blessing from a revelation God gave me. Just lift your hand to the Lord. A prophetic blessing from a revelation God gave me. If you've ever seen, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but one where kids would see this sometimes. Uh, lizards, like when a lizard's tail is cut off, Immediately, you see the tail still shaking, you know, just, you know, wriggling and, and shaking. Or, uh, I don't know, I know my kids have never seen this, but when we're kids, a, a chicken, to be prepared chicken meal, you know, for those who raise chicken, you actually have the chicken killed. Uh, sometimes when you kill it, you see it still fluttering and shaking and, you know, all over the place. Okay, so that image. God showed me that. Uh, the Lord has cut off. He has, he has cut the serpent. You know, when, when you cut it, like if you ever killed a snake, when you chop it immediately, you see it shaking a little bit. So I saw that. The Lord has cut it. The Lord has cut it. Um, for the pastors and ministers or those who care, <laughs> the scripture, God says, our cut. He, our, the Lord has cut it. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. God who delivered Israel from, from Egypt, from Pharaoh. 
There's a scripture where God, instead of saying Egypt, he says, I'll cut Rahab. But by Rahab, he means Egypt. It's in, the, it's in Isaiah. I'm just saying it for those who. But I saw it. God has cut off that which came against you. And what came against people was Satan using his pride, saying he's going to destroy and there's nothing that you can do. You can never be free. God showed me he has cut it. And, and I, saw, I saw the tail of the thing just shaking after God cut it. Amen. So I want to speak that prophetic blessing over you right now with your hands raised to God. But it's been cut. And, and, and believe me, it's scriptures. God says, I'll cut Rahab. But Rahab there is not the Rahab of the Bible who got saved from Jericho. It's, 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 poet, it's poetry in the Bible from Isaiah. God says, Rahab is Egypt. And he's saying, just like I delivered Israel from Egypt, I cut Rahab to bring people out of Egypt. Amen. All right, so that's the scriptural basis for this. All right. Father, I thank you for people who have raised your hearts, your hands to you, looking to God, looking to God, looking to God and not man. I pray against any spirit of pride that was operating by the devil through anybody against your people. In the name of Jesus, I stand as a worker together with God on the revelation that you gave me, and I pray this prophetic blessing over God's people. That Rahab, that Pharaoh, that bondage has been cut in the name of Jesus. I sever, I cut every cord that attaches you to a past of bondage, of fear, of disorder, of confusion, of slavery in any operation or manner, any manner of slavery and bondage is cut off, be loosed in the name of Jesus. And just as Israel came out of Egypt with silver and gold, everybody healed and strong with dignity and honor. Come out! Come out from amongst them, people of God, in the name of Jesus. May you come out with strength. May you come out with vitality. May you come out with power. May you come out with wealth, great wealth and health. And the Lord use you as a search and rescue worker with God to save humanity in these United States and around the world. I pronounce you blessed. Blessed with peace. Peace for yourself. Peace for your home. Peace. The shalom of God be your portion today and evermore. By the faith of God, I call it done. In Jesus' much less name, we give you thanks. Amen. We give you thanks. Woo! Glory to God! Give the Lord a mighty shout! Woo! Hallelujah! Oh, lift your hallelujah to God. Somebody give the Lord a shout! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory be to God. I know God has done great things for you. Give him praise. Somebody thank him right now for your house. I know we'll thank him later, but let's do it right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, people. It's easier to do it right now when others are doing it than later. Let's give him praise. Give the Lord a shout. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. Glory, 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 glory. Glory to Jesus. Thank you for divine rest. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Somebody's going to come and lead those in church to give offerings and tithes to God. But those of you around the world, 
you have three ways that you can give to God's work. As I was saying to, about the woman of Shunem, she found a way to give to the man of God to advance God's work. And she was just laying a foundation for her own peace and prosperity. So you do that today. You can give by Zell. Those of you who are aware of Zell know about Zell transfer, Zell bank transfer. The number to give to World Missions Ministry, Zell transfer is 571 234 2387. I'm going to repeat 571 234 2387. Everybody online, you can give via Zelle or via PayPal. PayPal is World Missions Ministries. Excuse me. PayPal is WMMChurch.org. Online. Just go online to WMMChurch.org. .org, and just click the donate button and give. And anybody who wants to give by mail, uh, send a check to World Missions Ministries, give by mail. Is to World Missions Ministries. The address is 6805 East Clinton Street, Clinton, Maryland, 20735. I repeat the address, 6805 East Clinton Street, Clinton, Maryland. The zip is 20735, USA, of course. Thank you. The Lord bless you. Bless your giving, everybody online. God bless you for supporting this ministry to do God's work. And the Lord calls you to find your missing silver coins in the name of Jesus. Empower you financially to be able to have, to give to those who don't have, to be able to seek, search, and rescue others. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless.